first of all, I wanted to say thanks for coming on here, but most importantly, uh, thanks for being in, like we talked about before, you were an integral part in setting my career in the right path. You sent me and Sundance to Davis Monthan right off, right out of tech school, and that was a, a very uh, important uh, milestone in my career. So I, I want to thank you for that too, and I appreciate yeah. it. No problem. I'm glad I was able to help you out. Yeah. I've always looked at you as one of those legends of the career field, like you're, you're right up there with all the guys I've had on before. And I appreciate you coming on here and telling your stories. Um, so, let, But what I don't know is like your background. I, I, I know the background mm-hmm. that you sent me, but let me start off with uh, you growing up in Massachusetts and, uh, and what mm-hmm. prompted you to get in the military. Okay. Well, before I get into that, you know, when you drop a word like legend, <laughs> I have to step back because... I mean, I've listened to a lot of the guys that you interviewed on here, a lot of my friends of mine that we were together. Guys like Marty Klukas, Roger Cross, Kenny Lindsay, who I mentioned to you, was absolutely one of my all-time favorite. And, you know, Jazz and Keith Ingram, who you just interviewed recently, yeah. obviously, who was a supervisor for you. You know, these guys, Doug Tillman, obviously, they were legends in my eyes. They did a lot of things. That, you know, we went kind of different paths along the ways, but... Um, well, the thing is, is I, you know, I just want to thank you for what you've done here. This has been a great format that you've set up for guys to be able to tell their stories. And some of these guys, obviously, the guys that you interview from post 9-11 in Afghanistan and Iraq have some powerful stories to tell, some powerful messages as well. So I'm I'm just humbled that you that you reach out to me and ask me to to be on, on the show. And again, uh, I appreciate uh, what you're doing for the community and the format that you've put out there. Because a lot of these guys, like I said, I know when we were stationed together. But we left and we we got split up from each other on assignments and all. So I found out more about Doug Tillman from listening to your interview <laughs> with him than I ever knew about his career. And I know that guy has been one of my closest friends for 40 years. Right. So it's just great what you're doing. And I and again, I appreciate the opportunity to be on. So oh, it's my pleasure. But, but yeah, Massachusetts. So um, I was born in Fall River, Massachusetts, which is down uh, south Massachusetts. It's really cl- closer to Rhode Island. Um, than it is Boston and moved from there when I was like five years old. My parents were both educators um, involved in school, teachers. My father was a very good athlete, um, very good baseball player, um, played in college, basketball and baseball were the two biggest sports in our families. But we moved to a, a coastal town, not too far from Far River. It was It's called Mattapoisett. And I lived on Massasoit Way. Okay. So growing up, Anybody wanted to know where I lived, I could just automatically tell them I live at 7 Massasoit Way in Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. <laughs> now, how do you think that is for a kid to have to be spitting that out? Oh, yeah. But it, to me, it was a normal, natural thing. Sure. You know, and that's where I, I stayed all the way up and through high school. But uh, again, father was very big into sports. Um, I'm the oldest of four brothers. I've got one that's a year younger than me, one that's five younger, one that's nine years younger. Uh, very demanding, you know, and then when you start getting up in your teenage years and all, you get a little rebellion in you and you want to do this and do that and all that. And things didn't always click very well. And, uh, you know, there were some you know controversies here and there along the way. And it's not like in my family we had a, uh, a long military history. You know, I mean, I listen to Keith's interview. With, I mean, he's got family going all the way back to like Revolutionary War, <laughs> right. you know, who, who participated in every campaign since then. So that wasn't the case with me. With me, it was really more of I knew I needed to get away. Mm-hmm. I knew I, I just needed to get away. Um, I thought about college. But at the time, it wasn't the right thing for me. So somehow or another, I ended up at the Air Force recruiter in, when I was in 11th grade. And I didn't really, I don't know, I, I guess I had heard that the Air Force was the way to go, it was better quality of life. And I don't think I ever even talked to the Marines or the Army or the Navy recruiter. At, at that time, the career field, you know, the TACP career field, the job itself and all that, as you know from some of the other people that you've interviewed, was kind of in a transition type situation. And, there, you know, there were things that the Air Force didn't really know you know, like the recruiters, they didn't really know what Pac P school was and being a role mad and all. They didn't know. Um, but it was something I was really interested in because I knew I didn't want to be in an office. I knew I didn't want to be sitting at a desk. I knew I didn't want to be in transportation or in in a motor pool or anything like that. He told me about this job. I read about it and I said, that, you know, that looks really cool. I think that's something that I really like to do. So so I signed up to late enlistment 11 months before I left. Oh, wow. So um, 10 days out of high school, my mother took me to uh New Bedford, Massachusetts, and put me on a bus and went to Boston, went through the whole MEPS situation and all that, and then got on my first plane that I'd ever been on and uh, flew down to Lackland. 
And that's where, uh, that's where it all got started. And then I think, you know, I mentioned to you, so when I got the basic training, this was 1980. There were no timeout cards back in 1980. Right, you right. couldn't step back. In. And um, post-Vietnam, not too far out of Vietnam, some hard charge and drill instructors. I definitely had an eye-opening experience. I hadn't come from that type of world. I hadn't been around the military. Yeah, I learned a lot along the way and I screwed up a lot and made some mistakes. But uh, now when you look back, you, you just recognize all the things that are just laid out for you. It's all about development right. and developing you in, into a young airman. Like I said, those DIs didn't necessarily know what career fields we were going into. They were just trying to develop us as airmen. So then halfway through my tenure there at Lackland, I got called into the administration section or whatever it is or something like that. And they say, uh, uh, Air Force screwed up your job or your school doesn't start for another year. So you're going to have to pick another job. And I said, okay. I said, well, tactical air command and control specialist, you got anything else like that? You know, something. And of course they didn't offer me combat control or pararescue or anything like that. Yeah. So they, they offered me in-flight refueling specialist at, at um, Cannon Air Force Base. And they said, um, oh, you're going to go be a boom operator, whatever it is. And I said, okay. You know, I was 18 years old. I, I mean, I was disappointed, sure. but I just knew, obviously, I wanted to land somewhere. So I called my family back home in Massachusetts and said, hey, I'm no longer going to be a TACP guy down doing that job. I said, I'm going to be going out to Cannon Air Force Base and be on KC-135s and be an in-flight refueling specialist. So I went along with that. And then just prior to my, uh, just prior to graduation, they call me back in and they say, um, it looks like we messed up. And they say, <laughs> uh, it looks like there is a slot for your school and your school starts in September. And I said, okay, well, that was my original job that I wanted. So I'll take that one back. So they gave it back to me. But again, like I said, at that time, you know, like Doug, and uh, some of these other guys, Dan Gilliam, Bobby Urkel, all them, they they were before when everything, because when I went to Harvard, everything was at Harvard. Right. They hadn't started sending people off to Fairchild and all that kind of stuff. So um, Doug's group before that, they had bounced around in different areas and all. So, so they sent me to Keesler from Lackland because I, I think they thought I was still supposed to go to Keesler because that's where they thought the school was at. Yes. So I was at Keesler bouncing around for like three days and nobody really, you know, just doing details and doing different stuff. And nobody really knew where I was supposed to be until somebody looked at something and figured out and said, hey, this guy's supposed to be down the road over there at Full Walton Beach at Herbert Field. So they loaded me up on a bus and my journey continued and I got there to Herbert Field. I remember I got there at night, late at night. And um, so this was August of 80 and my class didn't start for like another month. And I was in Eagle One, which was the first class. I think Keith said, I think he was in Falcon One. Right. Johnny Kleber was in Hawk One. And um, when I got there, I mean, when, when you were there, did they have the old, um, the old dorms right across from the PT field? Yeah, right. Yep. So when I got there in that whole barracks, there was only two people in there. <laughs> and one was Dan Gilliam. And the other was a guy named Bob Breeden. And Bob was, uh, I don't know what, what you'd call him, you know, an administrative guy. You know, he was the one who was responsible he was kind of like a quasi first sergeant, but he wasn't a first sergeant. Um, and they were the only two there for like a month. And so for like a month, I just kind of hung out with them. You know, we'd go downtown, got to know Dan. Dan was a senior airman back then. And uh, kind of just waited and waited. And then eventually, so some of the guys from my class started showing up, started drifting in and coming in. They were trying to figure things out because, again, this was the first class of this new school right. that didn't include Keesler, that didn't include Fairchild. And um, started with doing the PT, all the cool stuff. I know that Doug and, and uh, Keith talked about uh, Billy Wells and a lot of these the instructors that we had there where they were post-Vietnam instructors. You know, a lot of these guys were senior NCOs. They'd been around for a long time and uh, very experienced. But the stuff we learned back then versus like what you learned when you went through and certainly what the guys are learning today, it's just night and day. Sure. You know, ours was... Very basic in a lot of ways, basic communications, obviously some nav, nine line and cast procedures, but they were still trying to figure a lot of that stuff out at that time. I, I can't remember how the jump school thing came up. I knew I wanted to go to jump school um, and, and they only had a couple slots. Right. So I was able to get one of the slots. After I graduated the schoolhouse, I was able to, to go on a jump school. I, gr I graduated like in December of, uh, of 1980, which was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> So one of the things I was going to mention about the schoolhouse, because I put a note in there when I sent it to you, was about Dan Gilliam when he was there. So Dan was there as an instructor. Okay. 
because at the schoolhouse, and I think they only did this twice because they did it with a guy that was in my class named Ted Jakes. Very sharp, very smart guy who's probably the you know valedictorian of our class or whatever. But what they would do is, is they would offer him a slot as an instructor after graduation. Huh. And that's how they ended up staying there. But I think, which was the wise thing, that over time they realized that that's not the best move right. for a guy coming straight out of school who hasn't been on a deployment, hasn't been in the field, hasn't really done the job, hasn't had the training, you know, doesn't have the credibility. Yeah. And um, I think after Ted, they, they stopped doing that. Yeah, I mean, when you were when you were eighteen years old, nineteen years old, and they're saying, "Hey, you want to stay here and be an instructor with us?" That's that's pretty enticing. Sure. I mean, it makes you feel pretty special, yeah, but yeah. definitely not the best move. So I went on to jump school, went to Benning, did my five jumps there. They didn't have to kick me out of the aircraft. I couldn't wait to get out of the aircraft. <laughs> right. You know, I was one of those guys. I was always, even over the years, I was just like, "I'm ready to go." Yeah. I came up in this aircraft to jump out of it, so I want to spend as less time as I possibly can. Right. If it was a Chinook. So I went to Benning, had gone home on leave, came back. And then just like Keith, my first assignment was at the 21st task at, at, uh, at Shaw Air Force Base. Got there in like February of 81. Keith wasn't there yet, but he came eventually. And there, and there were there were a lot of guys there. Um, there were young guys, but there were some guys that had been around for a while too. It's a different type of unit. It wasn't like being at Bragg or being down at, at Benning or at Hunter or, or any of those type of guys. Obviously, we had to deploy in order to be able to, su to support our Army units. Right. And I was uh, aligned with the 82nd and supporting them. So when I first got there, the very first night when I walked into the barracks, they had a huge party going on uh, on the bottom floor in, in, the, in, the, in the break area. And these guys are screaming and yelling, and they've got they've got this big trash can in the middle of the floor, and that was my first exposure to well, that, that, at that time they called it Purple Jesus, but you know eventually it was <laughs> it had a lot of other different names because it had every alcohol possibly in it. Right. So my last name's Cavallo, right? So my you know, but it's actually Portuguese. But a lot of people think it's Italian. So when I walked in there that night, there were two guys in there: Vinny Vintenner and Joe Bellasini. They were young airmen, um, but they were had been around a little longer than I. And they're they're both very Italian. Yeah. And as soon as I came in and they were like, Cavallo, he goes, we got another Italian brother in the house. Welcome to the brotherhood. And I was like, yeah, man, I'm Italian. Bro, let's go. <laughs> so I spent my entire time there, but everybody thinking I was Italian, you know, I just let it run with it. Again, 18, young, you know, not knowing a whole lot. I saw a lot of things when I was there, just like you did. I mean, and we'll talk about Bragg later on. I mean, to me, nobody compared to the 14th when it came to beatdowns and hazing oh, yeah. and that kind of stuff. But we certainly had our share of it there at Shaw. Mm -hmm. Beside the blood wings and everything else, there, there was just a lot of crazy stuff that went on. Tape them up and throw them in a trailer, in the motor pool, you know. It was fun on jump status. A lot of jumping. And when you're at an Air Force, but obviously at Bragg, at, you know, 14th, you guys had Pope. You know, right there, we had a lot of access to aircraft and all. Um, we used to go down to North Field, which was out in the middle of somewhere down near Charleston. It's just an open area out there that they that they did training at. But we would normally we would go down there to jump. Um, so most of the time, what we would do is we would drive and we would drive like a, you know, a deuce and a half down to uh, Charleston, get on a 141, and then we'd go out there and do low level jump ops at night. C7s, jump them out there. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. I, again, was aligned with Bragg. So you went up to Bragg to work on you know, FTXs and other stuff like that. That's when I met Doug and got to know those guys really well up there. Had a lot of respect with them. Jumped with them up there on some operations and all. And then um, then I had an opportunity to go to Alaska and uh, on a TDY. There were several of us that, that went up there. I don't remember what the operation was. It was either Elmendor for Wainwright or whatever we went. But when I went up there, it was uh, January of, of 82. Man, I just fell in love with that place. Yeah. I was like, man, this is the most beautiful place ever, man. I said, somehow, some way, I'm going to get back here. I'm going to get an assignment here. <laughs> when I was there, I actually, when I deployed to the field with the unit, um, I was actually aligned with a, um Eskimo National Guard unit. So these were like 100%, you know, pure-blooded Eskimos. Huh. And um, I and they had their wives out in the field with them too. Really, you know, so, yeah. And, and they would set their tents. They did everything. It was the first time I ate walrus and all kinds of. And I mean, they were they were hardcore. Yeah, you know, they were hardcore chargers. And I mean, they they had their own separate identity and everything. And I can't even remember, like I said, how I how I ended up working with them. And it's not. It was more support than it was like a CAS operation or anything like that. So really enjoyed that. 
Never did get back there, though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, talk, I talk about that later on on my last assignment when I was trying. And the reason why is, is kind of like Vincenza. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, we had six slots over there. Guys would stay. In Alaska, guys stayed for years, yeah. years and years. Jackie Wallace, you know, Frankie Mabry, he's still there today. They got up there. They just they just never left. Mm -hmm. So still at Shaw, get an opportunity to go to Aerosol School. Uh, me, Keith Ingram, Frankie Mabry. Uh, went to Aerosol School together. Oh. Got an, got, a, uh, got an opportunity to to get training up there. That was actually my first exposure uh, to the 101st up there, and it, and it was actually the first. Uh, did you ever go to the old unit at Campbell? No, no, I never did. Okay. Well, I don't know if you ever heard about the locker room. You know, no. It's famous. But yeah, the locker room was the coolest thing ever. And then later on, when I got there towards the end of my career, we made it even cooler. But when you walked into the unit, there was an old World War II military uh, you know, facility. You walk down the hallway, and at the end of the hallway, there, the, there's these lockers on the wall. Uh -huh. And then if you took to the left, you'd go out into the bay. And when you're out in the bay area, there's lockers on this wall right here. Well, two of those lockers, one on the bay side and one on the inside, you open up that locker, you walk into the locker room. That was the bar set up and everything they had. It was just the coolest place. Yeah. Um, and we, we had a lot of great times when I was there, you know, later on in my last design. So, um, got a chance to get my senior wings, had enough jumps in or whatever, and went to uh, jump master school and got my senior wings and went to water survival. And I don't mind telling stories about me being stupid, but sometimes <laughs> when you're young and you think you're Superman, Frankie Mayberry was just one of the, I mean, Frankie was extremely fast, extremely strong, extremely, um, healthy. Yeah. And so me, him, and, and J-Mac, because J-Mac was at Shaw with me, too, uh -huh. on our first assignment. J-Mac and I were together, along with several other guys. We graduated uh, Water Survival on the last night, of course. We got to go out and celebrate out in some bar out there in Highway 1 or whatever. <laughs> well, so we work, we're coming back late at night, you know, walking across the base. And at Homestead there, they've got, like, these ditches all over the place. And, they're, like, they're coral reef on, like, both sides of the ditches. So we come uh, upon one. That's in the way of us getting back to our barracks, our dorm. And uh, I don't know, it's probably 12 feet across, something like that. <laughs> and so, of course, Frankie says, yeah, we can make this. I'm jumping this thing. <laughs> You're young like that. You feel you can do anything. Right. You know? So Frankie jumps and he barely makes it the other side. <laughs> so I said, well, heck, if Frankie can do it, I sure as heck can do it. <laughs> so I just remember being in the air and seeing the other side getting closer and closer and I smashed into that that coral on the side. Oh man! And fractured my fractured my wrist, fractured my elbow. I was in the hospital for a couple of days and all that kind of stuff. And obviously, when I went back to uh, the TAS back at Shaw, I caught a bunch of crap. But because J Mac, of course, after that happened to me, J Mac didn't even drop. Sure, like, sure. Really, man, he's like, get game over. Right. You know? <laughs> So obviously I wasn't jumping for a while. I had to heal up and, and, and get back into health. And then I did. And then I mentioned on there, because I know you work with the Ranger Battalions down there. I did get an opportunity to go out to, well, it was White Sands Missile Range, but we went to Fort Bliss with the first Ranger bat down there out of, out of Hunter. And uh, we actually were supposed to jump, but the, for some reason it was bad weather or something like that. And the, and the jump never, get, never went off. But I got to go out there. I don't know if we were at that time if we actually had guys at Bliss or not. I, I can't remember. I know I was back at Bliss later on. That's where I met Jim Burt and uh, Max Porras okay. and, you know, some of those other guys over there. But, um, you know, came back to Shaw doing the airman thing. At that time, I made senior airman below the zone. I became a supervisor. I was really fortunate to work for some great people throughout my entire career, both on the enlisted side and on the officer side. And I don't know. I mean, I consider myself to be just like, that, that frontline soldier, you know, I'll take a bullet for you. I'm not always going to be the one that's leading the charge and be making the calls and all that, but you know, I'm kind of like the sergeant at arms type and I'll support you hundred percent as long as you, you know, doing right by me, doing right by the air force. So a lot of guys gave me opportunities to do things and I worked real hard for them. And, um, as, as time went on, I think that also helped me as far as, like I said, to appreciate not just the career field, but the Air Force itself, because, you know, these opportunities were really kind of coming from the Air Force, too. Sure. So I'm there. And then uh, then this this guy shows up and uh, he was a character boy. I'll tell you, young airman named Mark Valella, you know, <laughs> and uh, I knew this guy was special, you know, right from the get go. When I was his first supervisor, you tell him to go out there. I mean, you could give him anything. You give him a wire brush. And he'll go out there underneath that Jeep and he'll scrub, 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 work, work, work. I mean, 
Mark was just, he was just hardcore right from the beginning. Yeah. You know, obviously extremely smart guy, obviously climbed the ladders of the career field, you know, like Kenny and Marty did as well and did very well for himself. And so Mark and I would bump heads every once in a while because yeah. I was my way and he was his way, but we're still close friends to this day. I was at his, his retirement ceremony when he retired as well. Yeah. So then um, I'm getting out. I don't want to be at Shaw anymore. I don't, I'm a, you know, Yankee from Massachusetts. I'm not that crazy. I'm, I like Shaw. I like the TAC P, but I really didn't like Sumter. And I just, I don't know. I just said, well, if this has been a good run. I'll, do, I'll just go do something else. So then out of the blue, like I get an assignment to Panama and they say, you want to go to Panama? And I said, I think I could do Panama. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I, I think I, I can, that would keep me in for a little while. Right. Um, so, they gave me the assignment to Panama. So they gave me the assignment to Panama, like right at the end of September. And a couple of weeks later was when Grenada kicked off. Yeah. And um, so me, John Morris and Jimmy DeMeo, uh, none of us, they wouldn't let us go. John had orders to brag. I, I don't remember what Jimmy had at, at the time. But I remember Pat Whitening pulling out of, out of the uh, out of the shop or the trailer, you know, saying, because they didn't know that it was an actual, and Keith talked about this a little bit in training, you know, they didn't know it was an actual deployment. Yeah. They just thought it was going to be another training exercise. And so I remember him pulling out and said, we'll be back. It's just another exercise. We'll be back. And then he he went off. I don't remember where Patrick, when he might have gone up to brag or whatever. It was extremely frustrating because Mark got to go. And I was like, okay, I only asked one thing. Please let me be gone before he comes back. You know, I don't want to be here when these guys come back. Yeah. I want to be gone. Lance Heaton had gone and filled a slot to jump in with uh, Scotty, Robert Scott, and Jeff Staha, who I know you interviewed uh, a little while back. And uh, I was like, I just want to be out of here before they come back. Sure enough, they come back. And I hadn't left yet because it was obviously a quick turnaround, sure. you know, down there. Mark Villella comes walking in the barracks. He's got a he's got a green duffel bag over his shoulder, and he goes, "Come on down here and check out this cool stuff I got." <laughs> I go into his room. He throws down the bag. He pulls out a Cuban shotgun, and he pulls out all this cool stuff. And I'm like, "Man, you've been, I've been here three years, you know, three years. You've been here six months, you know." And it was just timing. Yeah. It was just the situation at the time, and um, but it was what it was, and so I. Uh, I finished up my time and I went to uh, I went to Panama. I went to Howard. You were at Howard too, as well. Uh, we went. I wasn't actually stationed there, but I was TDY. With, that was the DM assignment that you got me. Was they, okay. they had to pull everybody out of Panama besides like Lunk and Chief Denny was down, or Master Sergeant Denny at the time. Those two were the only guys that were actually stationed down there, and the rest of us were at DM. We'd pull rotations down, but yeah, but I spent a lot of time down there yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, all I know is is when I got J Mac was already there, and I knew J Mac was going to be my roommate, so. When the plane landed, he came and picked me up. I didn't see the barracks for like a day because he took me downtown right away. Yeah. You know, Ancon in, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. Got introduced to monkey meat, all this crazy stuff down there. And um, so I was like, okay, well, this is definitely not Sumter, South Carolina. This is going to be different right. down here for sure. So um, got to the 24th. I think, like I said, I think I was a senior airman. I might have made Buck Sergeant at that time. I don't know if you could make Buck Sergeant back then. You know, I think they just give it to you after a certain amount of time. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. It's just like just like the others. Yeah, up up to that rank on jump status again. I get to jump a good amount down there. Not as much as like at Shaw. I mean, at Shaw we did a lot. And even was I was at the schoolhouse uh, going for the jump fest and all that kind of stuff. Right, right. And those things were always cool. But we did. Yeah, we did deploy a lot down there. Um, I did get an opportunity to get my uh, my Panamanian jump wings on an operation down there. And then, as I sent to you on there, went TDY to Honduras a couple times, Colombia twice. Oh, that was, man, that was a tough assignment there. We were staying up on like in a five-star hotel, <sighs> nice. you know, with a, with a rotating bar on, right on the beach. Right on. But you didn't have to go far from there to see that uh, not everybody lived that way in Colombia, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it was... Uh, and it was, then on one of my deployments to Honduras, I mentioned that um, I, somehow or another, I don't remember, but I got assigned to this El Salvadorian battalion. And I remember I, I, there's, a, there's an old picture somewhere. My brothers talk about it all the time. Um, it's like me... And like out in the, out in the field, out in the hungala, with the with three El Salvadorians, and uh, my mustache has grown. I got a little gruff, you know, all holding our weapons and all that kind of stuff. And I sent it back to them. They thought it was the coolest thing in the world. But most of the time, it was cast training. Mm -hmm. um, had a lot of opportunities, control some air. Uh, certainly in Panama, 
we went out to the range, good amount out there, control aircraft. So settled in there. A lot of guys came through. A lot of years have passed in my in my mind, so I have a lot hard time remembering a lot of the names. I remember some of the offices that I worked with o- over there. Obviously, like I said, J Mac was there with me. HR came down. Doug came down later. Doug, he came down my last year that I was there. Doug, Clay Christian, uh, HR Williams was there. Um, so there, there were several of us uh, that were down there. So worked, had my own, you know, my vehicle, take care of things. I think I was uh, a flight lead because you're on an Air Force base. All right. Um, I supported um, second bat out of the first of the 87. Did did some exercises with them. Um, did get to deploy or, or support third bat or third of the seventh. I think I told you one time that was yeah. pretty cool because they were on horseback. Oh yeah, and I got to ride. Yeah, and I can't remember where we were, um, and that's the first time I actually ate iguana. Oh really? You know, <laughs> killed an iguana and stuff, and uh, it was it was fine. It was so spent some time on the other side. Over a, was it is it was it Sherman? Yeah, for on Sherman. the other side. With the, yep. Yeah, with the survivor. You know, spent some time up there, and then all of a sudden I, I get notification that uh, they want to nominate me for Tactical Air Command and Control Specialist of the Year. My commander at that time, I guess, was impressed. You know, I'd done a lot of things and worked hard and all that kind of stuff. So, and I know Doug brought that up because I know he won in 86. So they sent me to Langley Air Force Base. Okay. That was one of the things about being in Panama. Boy, I sure flew back and forth to the States a lot. <laughs> what was it on the uh, Freedom Bird? I think it was called. I don't know. We came out of Charleston. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you. We yeah, always you flew commercial. So, yeah. We had, I, oh, yeah. well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like I said, this is 1983, right, okay. right. 83, 84. So they sent me up to Langley, and it was me. It was a guy from the 602nd and a guy from the 507. And it was Dole Kilgore, and I can't remember who the third guy was. But I remember sitting in front of these, like, three or four officers, senior NCOs on this board, getting uh, interviewed and questioned and all that other kind of stuff, and why was I deserving and so forth and so on. And... Um, it came out that I actually won. Um, they sent me back up to Hurlburt. I, I think the, in 85 is, you know, I won it in 84, but they sent me back up there in 85 and I was g- given the award and all that. And and then went back to Panama. And I guess they thought since I now that I was tax of the year that I needed to be a, a stand of out guy. But at that time, we really didn't have a an established stand of out program. Mm-hmm. I mean, we would do in-house type stuff, but not not a wing stand of out program. So I kind of spun that up. HR was helping me out with some of that as well and got that stand of our program in place. Actually, when I was there at the wing, uh, I think it was the vice wing commander. He was a, uh, he, well, he was either the vice or the wing commander, but he's a full bird colonel. His name was Dave Rader. And he was actually one of the Iran hostages. Wow. Yeah. Really? Yep. Dave was. Yep. Huh. Sure was. Great guy. So, um, Went up there. Actually, before I went to Stan about though, my notes are a little, you know, <laughs> flipped upside down sure, here. Sure. Um, I did go with a team from Panama to compete at Holbert okay. in, the, in the 84 competition, the early days of the competition. It was the only competition I ever competed in. I mean, I, I got to work a lot of them and run one myself, but that was actually the only one that I ever got to compete in. I don't remember how we did up there. I'm not sure that we did that well. But that gave me a little taste of Holbert again, see where it's been, you know, four years later since I'd been there. And then um, they sent us up to Bragg. We had a Jump Fest team that went up there to com- compete in uh, one of the Green Beret Jump Fests up there. Did well. Uh, came back in 85 and went to Shaw, another Jump Fest. We had a good team uh, back then. I, I mean, Jump Fest to me were the, I mean, obviously, you're sitting out in a C-130 or whatever with a ruck on and 120 other guys and mass tech and all. I mean, that's, what's, that's what it's about as far as doing the job and getting into the field. Sure. But man, there's nothing more fun than jump fest. Oh yeah, I mean, jump fest were the best, yeah. man. And I mean, there's nothing like being up there in that helicopter and then throwing that streamer out and watching that streamer and see, you know, and then making your call and then realizing you know, that when you pick your spot and all. Next thing you know, all four you're you know, right in the gravel pit, yeah. and they're just so much fun. Oh yeah, I mean, we just I, I really enjoyed uh, the jump fest, and we had a lot of them back then. You know, I don't know if they still continue if they did that during your time or not at the beginning yeah I, we used to go a lot as a matter of fact when i first got to benning i think i was on a team with jazz and kenny i can't remember who our fourth guy was but i i 
I put Kenny in the trees because I sent us out. I was jump mastering and I was brand new jump master. And this would tie into a story you're going to tell later uh, during that jump master course that you were at on a uh, green ramp. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I put, I put everybody out too early and everybody was mad at me and <laughs> Kenny was stuck in the trees. So yeah, when it wasn't a very good showing on my part, <laughs> but that happened, it happens to all of us. We had a whole stick one time at Pino down there on a C-130, and I wasn't jump mastering that. It was somebody else, and you know, he put the whole stick of us went in the trees. Oh, you know, so it happens. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I came back and, again, focused more on the stand of valve stuff. That's kind of what I was doing when I finished up my run there in Panama, mostly at the wing. Did go? They sent me to NCO Leadership School back in, in it was like November of 85. It was like a year before I left at, at Tyndall. And, um, you know, that kind of goes back to what I was saying to you when we first started talking. I mean, um, I know there's a lot of guys out there, and I'm talking about my fellow Romad brothers out there and all that, who love being Romads and 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 didn't necessarily embrace the um, the airman side of it as much. And, I, and I'm not discrediting any of them for that at, at all. I mean, some of them, again, I use Marty and Kenny, you know, were hard chargers as, as TACP guys in their day. Eventually, their rank and their promotions you know, thrust them into leadership positions outside of the career field. But I really enjoyed leadership school, quarterly awards. I like putting my blues on. I, I love dining out. Yeah. I mean, I really enjoyed those events, these events that were historical Air Force events that commemorated things like that. I really did enjoy that. And, and to me, I, I get to enjoy the best of both worlds, sure. you know, the TACP world and being in the Air Force. Because Lunk, <laughs> he loves to give me, you know, Lunk and I have been giving each other crap for years, although he's probably one up on me for sure. Yeah. You know, he, uh, yeah, he used to give me crap all the time because he would call me the air base. You're an air base Roman. <laughs> yeah. You know, you've never met on a four. You don't know, you know. Um, I did deploy a lot, but well, I don't know. Maybe I was smart enough to keep myself on an Air Force base where, <laughs> right. you know, quality of life were, was a little bit better. Right, right. So at that time, again, I didn't know what I was going to do, but then uh, tax of the year thing and all that. Um, somebody, they reached out to me about going to the schoolhouse and being an instructor. So I put a package together. I guess I had the right people to get to endorse it and all that. And so I got selected for an assignment to go to the, the schoolhouse in November of 86 Okay, was when I left Panama and went to the schoolhouse. But again, the school back then was still a little bit different. Even like when you went through, mm-hmm. we were still learning a lot of things. Some things were transitioning and shifting from the late 70s schoolhouse. To, and when like I went through, uh, there was new curriculum. There was new stuff that was being introduced. I actually... And I don't know if they still had this when you went through, but one, I, I was an instructor before I became an instructor supervisor. I was an instructor on air ground systems, but I was also on armament and Soviet studies. Yeah, I because we were in the Cold War right. back then, you know. And so, yeah, I I used to have to study up on my Soviet history, all that type of thing. And we would actually teach that in class, along with Soviet armament as well. I don't know if they probably had still had that when you went. Yeah, through. I don't know if they did or not. I don't remember that particular block, but. I mean, that would make sense if they got rid of it since the, the wall had come down after I went through. So the cold yeah. was kind of over by then. Yeah. So Doug, I think Doug had left. Oh, no, that's right. Doug had come to Panama. So he, he was already gone from the school. I talk a lot about jumping. But again, you know, and Doug pointed this out too. Um, back then, and I know it's not so much the case now these days because, and I'm talking about airborne versus non-airborne. Right. You know, there was a lot of animosity. There were some people who created the animosity that, within the airborne community. And there were some people on the other side who just, in general, just were antagonistic about things. There was a lot of, like Doug said, he used the term wasted energy, yeah. you know, between. I don't know what it was. I just somehow adapted. It didn't matter to me if you were airborne or not. Or what. I mean, yeah, most of the guys that I hung out with were airborne. We jumped and all this kind of stuff. But I had very close friends who weren't, you know, Warren Gardner is one of my closest friends from the military. And, and then when I got there to Ed Hobart, you know, Ron Spock and Dennis Wise, you know, I guess I just earned their trust over time. Sure. You know, they, they, I guess they just looked at me as not that that guy. Yeah. You know, even though I had the wings, even all that, I kind of just related to them well. And they saw that I had a common purpose that they had, which eventually, like Doug said, in the career field today, and I'm sure post 9-11, I mean, you know, look at Shropshire. Yeah. I mean, you know, to listen to his story, I mean, you know, that guy, it's Amazing. you know, I was, I was with him at Campbell when he was a young airman. And like he even said, he goes, I was a C plus airman, you know? <laughs> right. but I'll tell you what, when the time came and the opportunity came for him to stand up and do the job, you know, he didn't, he need to have any wings on his chest, right. you know? And I, 
I just, Doug had made that point when you talked to him and it was, it just brought up in my mind, my experiences and how I tried to, I'm not saying I was perfect by any means. And I'm sure there were some times where you know, I got a little bit arrogant or something like that, but I was just more open to all of us being together. Sure. Especially being an instructor, because there are a lot of students that were coming through the school that weren't going on to jump school. Right. I and mean, they were going out to, you know, drum or, or Hood or Riley or something like that. And I wanted them to all be good TACPs, all be good airmen. Right. You know? So um, that was just something I wanted to point out there. So um, going back to the jumping thing, <laughs> I did make a note. On, did you know, did you ever know Dan Hannigan? I, I, did I didn't know him Dan? really well, but yeah, I knew the name. And I think I've ran into him a couple of times, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ranger Dan. Right. right. And the reason why I bring up Dan is, is I knew Dan for a long time. So Dan, going back to the jumping thing, we jumped a lot at the schoolhouse. Yeah. I would get Hueys and Blackhawks in on Saturdays from um, Rucker. We'd set it up and, and they would come, they'd come flying in. We'd go out there you know, with a deuce full of parachutes and we just would load up uh, at Pino, jump, load up, jump, and all the time. And um, Dan was kind of, I always said Dan Hannah could do, could do more with a, with a telephone and, a, and an aircraft than anybody I ever knew. Yeah. That guy, some of the things that he, I went to Bermuda on a C-130 with him and wives and other people, you know, I mean, that um, we didn't end up jumping because it ended up not being weather-wise and all that. But yeah. I mean, he just came up with, Dan could make some things happen. He, he had a, a real talent for that stuff. Um, so one operation that he set up for us was a night jump. And it was somewhere here in Alabama, which is where I'm at now, Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, I don't remember where it, where it was, but it was on a 141. And they, um, it was a bad night. I mean, it was windy. It was just nasty night. And this drop zone wasn't even a registered drop zone. It was like a farmer's field that had been plowed up and all. And we were jumping equipment. And um, we got out there. It was dark. It was crappy. Johnny Kleber was with me, Dan. I can't remember who else was on that one. And uh, and so we jumped. And, and as soon as we jumped, and as soon as I went out, I had twists. I was, you know, got out of my twist. And as soon as I got out of my twist, I dropped my equipment. I don't remember what we jumped at 800 feet or maybe it was 1,000. And uh, as soon as I jumped, we dropped my equipment. My equipment started swinging and I was oscillating. And then so just before I hit the ground, my, my, my ruck swung the other way and it pulled my legs, kind of pulled my legs apart. Oh. And then my right leg just took the whole impact of, of the jump. And oh my God, and it wasn't good. <laughs> and Johnny hit really, really hard too. He, he, he buried his, his arms into the ground and he was hurt. Oh. And, uh, so yeah, I was, I was broke and, uh, they put me in a vehicle, uh, a blazer or something like that. And then drove me back to, I don't even remember where we drove me back. Eventually I ended up back, back down at Herbert, back in Florida somewhere. Um, but yeah, there's another broke injury there that knocked me out there for a little while. You so know, did it? Did again. it actually break? Like a you, your leg? Bro uh, you broke your leg? Oh yeah, oh. yeah. It was my ankle. It was my ankle. Oh yeah. okay. My heel, my 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 heel was like at 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 ninety, but and my toes were like at you know one eighty. Oh, they were like jeez. Yeah. But yeah, they put a big they put a pin in there, did surgery, all that kind of stuff. So that knocked me out for a little while. Um, gave me a chance to study a little bit more. I was working towards a degree at that time when I was in Panama. I had, I was Troy State at the time. It's Troy now. It was just one of those things. I always kind of set a goal for myself as far as getting my degree. I didn't really know what I wanted a degree in. And they kind of led, when you're in the Air Force, through Community College of the Air Force, and they kind of lead you down a path based on whatever your career field is. Right, right. And um, ended up getting my degree like in resource management or something like that. I mean, I've never really used it, you know, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I, you know, I just didn't have the need to as far as post-military is what my situation is now. Sure. Um, so got healthy again, be became an instructor supervisor, had a great group of guys underneath me, some super, super guys, Jay Dio, Ron Myers, Johnny Gillespie, John Morris came in eventually, Toddy Kessler, which, you know, you know the name Todd Kessler. I don't know. I don't think so. All right. So you know the the Tac P Litho. Like I've got a. Oh yeah, right I do. Now. I do that name. I thought that name sounded familiar. Yeah. yeah. So he's he's on the radio right there, and then it's got the A10 and the Black Hawk with the ropes coming yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, Ar yeah. Rob Arcerio's in that one. Right, well, right. Too. And yeah, and so just a great group of guys. Um, but they were always messing with me, <laughs> especially Gillespie. Yeah. You know, Gillespie especially. So they had come up with a plan that they were going, I would come back to my office and, and on my desk where my calendar was and all kind of stuff, there'd be footprints all over my desk <laughs> because they, they used to like to dance on my desk when I wasn't in there. So Johnny Gillespie came up with a challenge. He says, I'm going to dance on, on his desk while he's in the office and he's not going to catch me. So I remember one time I was in there and Dio's over there, Ron Myers. And then um, 
born. And then all of a sudden I had my back to her, my desk was behind me. And all of a sudden I heard this shuffle, shuffle, boom, boom, boom. And, and then I whip around and like all these papers are flying up in the air. And, and as I, uh, and, and Gillespie like falls in his chair and he's like, what, what happened? And, uh, and I look at my desk, his footprints all over the place. And, uh, you know, he had, I mean, I did see him. Yeah. You know, he, did, he didn't defy him, so. But yeah, th that was a, we had a real great group down there and, and some of the other blocks as well had some really good people. They made life fun down there, no doubt about it. Um, Gillespie actually, he got his degree. Yeah. There's some guys in the career field, I, I mean, from my time that I knew, Tommy Ray, mm -hmm. uh, Johnny Gillespie, um, obviously Jeff Staha, yeah. who got their degrees and then decided to transition and become officers. Right. So I kind of was confronted with that situation when I got my degree. I was 10 years in, so I was still at the schoolhouse. and. Um, I don't know. I just, um, I thought about it a lot. It obviously would have given me more money, a better quality of life, so forth and so on. But like, I mean, Johnny ended up retiring a major, but he left the career field and he went into an administrative field. Mm -hmm. And and I just, I didn't, unlike Staho, who obviously ended up in the special ops world, um, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to do that. Sure. I, you know, I, I liked the career field. I, I liked what I'd built up over the years. And, and I just decided to, to stay. Yeah. And, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. I mean, Doug got his, his degree as well. But uh, for those guys who decided to do it, that's great. More power to them. Um, but I, I've never regretted that choice. Yeah. I've never, never regretted staying the path that I was on. So um, in 91, they asked me to um, run the cast competition or not the cast, but the actual competition itself, mm -hmm. the 275 competition. So I was the lead guy behind it. Um, I had been doing the cast tests for a couple of years, uh, putting those together. Um, and, um, man, it was just great to see some of those guys come and compete. They were just, and it was some, and I'm not just talking about like on the O course, you know, I used to love to see Larry Patton, you know, Eric Kibbe, those guys would just tear that course oh, up. Yeah. And it was always, it was always a, just always a great event to be there when these guys would show up and just the competition and the way they were competing such hard charges and guys would come from Germany and kick butt on a lot of the stuff, you know, Jim Burt certainly, and him and John Morris did well. And, uh, and it was, it was just a fun, it was one of those events. Like I said, I just enjoyed being part of those events down there yeah. and, uh, and participating in. So, um, it was a good time when the career field then, I mean, we weren't involved in anything. We obviously Panama had happened in 89 mm -hmm. and I know you've talked to several guys about that. I was sitting at home on vacation from the schoolhouse <laughs> and then we weren't sending anybody from the schoolhouse then, but, uh, I mean, I, I mean, just listen to that. And again, I mean, I've talked to plenty of guys about Panama, the guys that jumped in and all that kind of stuff. But to listen to Keith lay down all that he, I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, man, I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know that, it, you know, because people look at uh, Grenada, Panama, even Grenada, you know, more so as far as not being a real, you know, but I mean, these guys, I mean, and it's the same thing with Desert Shield, Desert Storm. And I know you've mentioned that before. I'm not on the level of what's been going on over the past 20 years and what the guys have been involved in. But yeah, so I, uh, so 91, um, we get a request because uh, Desert Shield is kicked up. Not 91, I'm sorry, 90, in August of 90. And the schoolhouse gets a request for an instructor to come over there to, to, to do training with uh, Saudis and Kuwaitis on um, close air support operations, uh, radio operations, so forth and so on. So I got selected to go. Uh, Doug Akers was the commandant at the time. He wanted me to go. I said, okay, I'll go. So I left like November uh, by the time I got over there. Um, I was stationed at, at King Khalid military base. Charlie O'Reardon was over there with me. Uh, another guy, another airman there, Davis. I want to say it was John Davis. I, I, I just can't remember his first name. But the three of us were over there essentially doing the same thing. So up until mid-January when Desert uh, Storm kicked off, I was in the classroom teaching or, you know, in the classroom and then not up, up in Kuwait, but out in, out in the field. Sure. One of the coolest things, I tell this story a lot. When we first got over there and we were out there and we got in our vehicles, I mean, I used to do a lot of navigation in Panama as far as point to point navigation, so forth and so on. You look at these maps, you can figure out all kinds of stuff on the terrain. <laughs> right. You go over there to, to Saudi Arabia and you and op open up a map. Man, there's like nothing, <laughs> right. you know, I mean, there's like one major highway here, one major highway here. And then you're like, they want you to go to this point in between. So uh, I remember when we got our, our second vehicle, it wasn't long after I was there, that I get inside and inside there's this box mounted on there on the front. And, it, and it's it's good size. It's probably like, like I said about this wide. 
And uh, the guy says, boys, he goes, this fancy machine here is called the global positioning system, and it's going to help you to find your way out here in the desert. And he wasn't lying. Yeah. That thing was a lifesaver. Oh. You know, you put your coordinates in, you know, where you're at, where you want to go. And um, yeah, so when we were out there training and all that, navigating around that GPS, obviously you have the same thing on your phone these days. <laughs> right, at, right. at that time, you know, it was a whole different thing. But, um, you know, when I was there too, there was a lot of guys that obviously had already deployed over there. 82nd was there. There were a lot of, lot of guys that were over there. And there were a lot of guys, Jimmy Seabrooks was over there there were a lot of guys that were actually aligned with their units. So, you know, we had guys with the Egyptians, with the French, with the Syrians. Really? Um, I was with the Kuwaitis and the Saudis. Eventually when we deployed, I was with the Saudis. Huh. Um, and they were training with their, their guys as well too. Huh. Um, but like I said, I was the only one at that time from the schoolhouse. Later on, um, they did send in some more guys from the schoolhouse. Bill Martin, Ted Corbett, I know, uh, was over there. Um, but, but that was actually after the, uh, the air war story. Okay. Yeah. Once I'm there, then I think it was January 17th or whatever things kick off. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, we deploy as far as going up North, huh. you know, one of the things I say about over there too, is, is even more so than Panama, I mean, gamma goblin shots and all the other good stuff that we used to get, yeah. man, they stuck us with so much stuff over there. I have no idea what was some of it. I just, I always say people talk about, oh, you should be concerned about this. You can be, I said, man, my immune system has been racked over so many times, right. you know, over the years. I said, I don't think there's a whole lot you can put in me that my body's not going to fight off. Yeah. It hasn't already fought off, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so we, um, we deployed, uh, went up there with our vehicles. Um, there were two officers that were with me from Herbert, uh, a guy named Al Gore, uh, Major Al Gore and a, and a guy named uh, Miles Bat. Both of them were majors. And, and Gore was just a beloved figure in in the career field. I mean, anybody that knew him down there at Herbert and all, he's just a, just a great guy. But it was a lot of sitting and waiting, mm. sitting and waiting, sitting and waiting. Yeah, we had some, obviously the scud alerts, and there were some scuds that did land in a few places. People were concerned about chemical weapons, put our mop gear on, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But then eventually made our way up into Kuwait, um, and by that time, air power and the, the advanced ground forces had really taken care of things. Right. Um, I was up there. I could I could see the the fires burning from the oil fields. weren't far from there. Um, went into some bunkers. We said I actually found a great. I found a, a Kuwaiti flag. It was a Kuwaiti battle flag, and uh, I can't remember actually what it said. I had it for years, and then um, I sent it up to Bragg when Randy Long was up there. They were putting some type of museum or something together. And uh, and sent it up to that to, to him, and then um, hung out, did our thing. Everything was over with, rolled back, and then eventually uh, came back home. So was it like I said? It, it was quick. It was a couple months, but I mean, so yeah. Then I was back, and I was back at the school. Came back, went to the NCO Academy. Love that. Like I said, well, not NCO leadership school. I did that in Pan Panama, so senior NCO leadership school. Met my wife, got married after that. Well, we had actually met before I went to Saudi, um, and. I don't know. She was just, I guess, foolish enough to hang around and wait for me to come back. So, you know, we've been married 32 years now. Oh, so. nice. Um, so came back and then uh, back in the schoolhouse, you know, doing my thing and all that kind of stuff. And then some things started changing. You know, Acres retired. Some other people came in, kind of pushing the school in a different direction and all that from where I was used to. And I was kind of like, OK, it's really getting time. It's time for me to go. Yeah. You know, so where, where's my assignment to Alaska? Because I told you guys 11 years ago, I want to go to Alaska. <laughs> right. Well, they, it just doesn't miraculously happen that way. Yeah. So um, one day they call us all down to the, uh, to the uh, down to Agos, out to the Jeep pen out there. And they, they got us all lined up out there and all this kind of stuff. And they say we had a special visitor and it, it was Air Combat Command at that time. Mm -hmm. So it was General Lowe who was the air combat commander and he was coming down to talk to us so we're all standing there and he's talking and he's i'm just an awesome leader and individual and uh all of a sudden he said uh he couldn't pronounce my name right he was like <laughs> kel valho Calvejo, where are you at come out here and he called me out in front of everybody and all that kind of stuff and he he gave me a step promotion to master oh nice you know at that time so you know that was that was really special and greatly appreciated but i knew at that time too as soon as that happened i was like okay 
yeah, it's definitely time for me to go sure. and I got to find some place to go. So Dennis Wise, who was then, I think he was at the Pentagon then, um, he called me up and he told me that there was, there was a slot open at, at Fort Campbell. I guess at that time it was like debt five before it became the, um, the 19th ASOS. It was an E8 slot. I was an E7, but they didn't have anybody to fill the slot. He wanted me to take the job. I didn't really want it. I didn't know if I was going to be on jump status or not, what the situation was. But at that point, again, like I said, you go through your career, I'm sure, I mean, Marty and Kenny and other senior NCOs and all that eventually get to the point where you, now you need to take assignments that are that best serve the Air Force, right. not necessarily best serve your wants or desires. So I go, once I get up there, I'm back in the locker room again, <laughs> where I'd been years ago, and a uh, lot of different guys there, big mix of guys, guys that have been at Riley and at Hood, you know, a lot of in armored guys, some infantry guys, some jumpers, but definitely a mix bag of people there. And um, so I was excited about it. I had 70 guys underneath me and um, eventually I did get a slot and I was on jump status. Nice. So I was a superintendent over three brigades. I was assigned to the division. The commanders there at the time, the, the commanders I did have there were very supportive of me, but it only lasted a short time because what happened was you know, Tim Finn uh, made E8 in Hawaii and they sent him to fill that slot. So I got kind of got knocked back down, which was okay. And so um, a lot of young guys, good guys went through there. I mentioned Shropshire before, but I had mentioned some other names, you know, Goggins was there at the time, okay. uh, Ed Shulman, Frank Riley, who ended up crossing training over to pararescue. Good young airmen that, that I really saw a lot of potential in. And I would give any of them my time, my my efforts to try, but some, some guys just really stood out. And uh, I was trying to help them as much as I could. So that was 93. Um, 94 comes around and then oh, you mentioned it before. So 94, I had two events during 94 that were pretty significant. The first one was Tim Finn and I, he was actually a student in the jump master course at Bragg. I had gone back to Bragg from Campbell multiple times, made that drive uh, from Campbell to Bragg for different things, for jump master school or for being an instructor in jump master course, quality training, all kinds of different things. Right. So yeah. we go back and then, um, Tim's in the class. Brian Daly was there at the time. He was an instructor with us. And I know Doug and obviously Marty, Jay Mack, they've mentioned about Brian to you, who passed away mm -hmm. out there in Yuma. Um, so that one day we're sitting down at the end of the, at Pope Air Force Base. We're in a training building there. And the green ramp was over to the right side over there. And there was a bunch of guys from the 82nd that were getting ready for an operation. And there was a C-141 that was parked right in front of the building that we were in, right beside the green ramp. And so we're inside doing some type of training, administrative tra training inside. And all of a sudden, man, that building just rocks. I mean, it just pop, boom is one of the loudest noises ever heard. So I go running outside, kick open the doors. And when I run outside, the first thing I see is a parachute from the pilot who had ejected. Right. Um, you know, I think it was an F-15. It was an F-15 and a C-130. And that F-15 just barreled down the runway. And um, obviously part of it hit the 141 and that's what caused the explosion and all. But the other part of it was, was the F-15 hitting the end of the runway and the guys that were on the green ramp. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just chaos. Hey, 23 guys died that day in the green ramp, something, something like a hundred were injured. And, and, and then the, the rest of us, we just kind of shoved and pushed away, you know, as everybody was coming in, MPs and all that kind of stuff, every, everybody's pushed away. Rounds were popping off from the F-15, from the heat and all. So it was just a tragic day. It really was. Where were you at that time? I was in that building with you. I was a, a student in that jump master course at the time. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize. Oh that. yeah, yeah. I uh, I remember running out the door and uh, I was just following Lunk. We were kind of running. To, uh, I, you came out the door, made a left, and we just kind of ran to get away from the the debris. Yeah, that was a that was a crazy. That we thought we didn't even know what was happening. We thought that there was like an earthquake or something, and we didn't know. Yeah. You know something blew up or yeah. But and it was horrible that those paratroopers got got killed but if that 141 wouldn't have been sitting there in front of that building that that fighter would have ran into our building i mean we would have sure. probably all been taken out so yeah yeah absolutely yeah. see that's why i tell you i i can pick remember snippets of time and people and all that but if you would ask me who was in that jump master course beside the instructors you know that were with me i wouldn't have oh remembered. for sure so yeah even, we're just the I students yeah remember. of course yeah exactly well, I never known at that time, you know, guys were a lot more than students, you know, but, um, but yeah, like I said, you know, a lot of years, a lot of people, a lot of things, and, uh, it's not as much room left up here to retain stuff as there used to be. Right. So I got another, um, 
opportunity in 94. This was a much more positive, better opportunity. So the 101st said um, that they were going to take a group from the 101st over to Holland to celebrate the uh, 50th anniversary of Operation Market Garden from 1944 when the 101st jumped in there to, to uh, fight the Germans. I remember that the commander at the time was um, a guy named Colonel Dave Beatty, and he was ju- he was a jumper. He was hardcore too. Yeah. I think he was you know, senior wings or whatever. But he um, he wanted to go bad. They only offered us two slots. The uh, the hundred first the division offered us two slots for our squadron. Mm-hmm. So it was going to be me. But the thing is, is, they put a prerequisite on it. They said you have to have graduated from aerosol school oh. in order to be able to go. So that knocked him out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that left me and Rob Arcario. Okay. Okay. And you know Rob. Yep. Right? Yep. And um. At the time, the 101st Division commander was Jack Keane. Jack Keane is a very prominent individual. I don't know. I mean, you, all you have to do is click on national news a lot of times, especially on Fox. You'll see him. He's the He was chief of staff, and he's been an advisor okay. ever since. You know, Just a brilliant man. He was a two-star back, back then. So we get to go over there, and it was the coolest thing. <laughs> and what made it the coolest thing, we didn't even get to jump. Because when we got over there, now some people got to jump, yeah. but we didn't get to jump because the weather was really crappy yeah so i think our Syria and i were on the second stick i don't know they might have been four planes maybe four c-130s and um the weather was crap and general king was on the first path and he broke his arm oh on the drive <laughs> and when he broke his arm they connixed the rest we were hooked up ready to go was he did and they yeah, was it, so, i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but was it uh the weather was bad is that kind of why he broke his arm or yeah, like he's like, all yeah. right, the, the general broke his arm. Nobody else is jumping. We don't want to hurt anybody else. Yeah. 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 It w- I think it was more or less that. I think we could have jumped, but I think because he broke his arm, they just didn't want to act like they were ignoring the safety of the additional personnel sure, sure. or whatever. All I know is it sucked because <laughs> when we landed, when we landed and we got in the vehicles to take us back downtown to Holland, the people who did jump were there and they were wearing their their dutch jump wings and, oh. and flashing them in our face yeah. you know but uh but the great part about that like i said was not us and not even the 101st but man that the real deal that the guys who were in from the 101st from market garden there were a bunch of them there oh really from world war ii and they were just awesome man yeah. they just I mean, that's the greatest generation this country's ever seen and just to be around those guys and spend time with them and the people there the dutch they loved Americans, you know, as far as what we did, as far as coming in there and running the Germans out and all that. I mean, they invited us into their houses. I was sitting at dinner tables with World War II veterans and the Dutch people feeding us their food. It was just great. Yeah. It was just, I mean, the part that we didn't get to jump, yeah, that kind of <laughs> kind of stunk. But I mean, all in all, it, it was a great event. It was really good to be there. So I go back, I'm running the unit, and I'm going back and forth to brag again for other stuff, right? So I was telling you earlier when we first started talking about the hazing. So, oh, yeah. I mean... I mean, I was never stationed there, but I mean, I spent a heck of a lot of time at Bragg. Same here. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I spent a lot of time there between Shaw, between Panama, between Campbell. Not so much when I was at the schoolhouse. And those guys, they just came. So Johnny Kleber, I think at that time, he was the uh, 14th superintendent or whatever. But I remember one day I was going back there and I pulled on the base and I can't remember who was with me. And I'm over there on the back side of the base near the flight line. And as I'm pulling in, I noticed this dude walking around. And he's like waddling around. He's got swimming fins taped to his feet. And he's got a he's got an oar stretched across his shoulders, <laughs> taped to his shoulders. And he's got some type of funky helmet on his head. And he's got all this crap hanging, which I found out later on was like dead fish and all this other kind of stuff. Right. And he's waddling across the base. Now, this was Shane Dunn. <laughs> I used to call him meat and they had dropped him off on the other side of the base like this. And he had to work his way back all the way back to the unit. And I was just dying. I was just, I mean, I drove around a couple of, I couldn't pick him up or do that. I I was just dying. So another time I'm over there at at the 14th and I know Johnny was in charge then. And I'm standing in the Bay area and all stuff. And then all of a sudden this flower vehicle pulls up. And and this uh, woman gets out with these flowers and balloons and comes walking towards the debt. She goes, hello. And then Johnny Kleber, everybody standing, Johnny Kleber goes, oh, yeah. He goes, somebody's getting a pink belly today. And then she said, 
I'm here looking for Johnny Cleaver. Oh. These, are for, these are for to wish him a happy anniversary. Oh, no. And, and, and everybody just went, oh, and Johnny's eyes just <laughs> lit up. Because his wife, Terry, we've known them for 40 years. Yeah. She knows better. Yeah, right. She should know better than to do something like that. But those guys that brag, I mean, Mikey Brown, yeah. oh, Larry Patton, I mean, Sean, I know you interviewed Sean, Mike Bender, and Eddie Morales, Lunk, obviously, all those guys. They just, they were... They're a good group. Solid, and even back yeah. in, the, in the early days, they were solid guys. I loved going over there and, and being with them. Oh, family. yeah. But back in my world at the 19th ASOS, about that time, that's when the soft thing started to kind of come about. Right. So fifth group, then 160. Right, right. We had never had guys at those units before. Mm -hmm. And um, we got guys internally. Chris Brewer was running it over there. Then, then we had some other guys internally that ended up going over there. Later on, even more guys, even after I left. But on the 160th side, it was it was Johnny Kleber, Larry Patton, Brad Ellis, and Jim Heron. Yeah. Those were the four. And they made life hell for me. <laughs> and the reason why was is because they wore flight suits, walk around with, you know, big mustaches, <laughs> Fu Manchu, no anything, and, and you know, just looking. And they would and they would come over to the squadron where I've got all my young, influential uh, airmen. Right, right. And my office was at the end of the hallway and they would come in and kick open the door and come walking down the hallway and all the air and be like, Oh God, look at these guys. And they go, Hey, where's Ray J at? We're over here to see Ray J. And I, I, I'm, I'd sit in my, and I'd hear them come in and hear them say that. And I would just get up and I'd be like, cause they knew, yeah. you know, I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> but that was, that was part of the new world. Yeah, you know, yeah. and they, those guys, they did a lot of good stuff and, Obviously, the soft world has grown beyond my imagination when it comes to special tactics and all that. And you know, it started back there at JCU, you know, when Doug was there and all. But right. just a good opportunity for these guys. For myself personally, I just I was just never lined up on my assignments to be at a soft right. or be at JCU. And you know, I was really like I said, as I was making rank, I was enjoying doing what I was doing. I was enjoying being a leader of young men and, and you know, just enjoyed that. And I can't say that I was aggressively pursuing. Sure, sure. Yeah, so, but I had all the respect in the world for the guys that did do that job because they, they were gone a lot. Yeah. A lot of time away from home, a lot more time away from home than I spent. For sure. You know? So, um, you know, I have all the respect in the world for them, except for when they come, come into my office asking for <laughs> Ray J. So another E8 is coming in from Germany. A guy named Daryl Bars, he passed away years ago. He and I were definitely 180 degrees out on how, how we looked at things and all that. But he was an E8, so he took the slot. I got bumped back down. So I actually became like the squadron acting first sergeant. We didn't have a first sergeant or anything at that time. Well, we had somebody filling it, but he had left. So I uh, became the acting first sergeant, was filling that role. I was still on jump status. I was still doing my TACP duties and all that. But now I was doing more first sergeant. I was going up to Scott Air Force Base, different things, administrative stuff and all. And it didn't look like things were going to change as far as me going back over to over to the unit, back into that, that superintendent position. Um, I did get an assignment to Korea, uh, to Camp Humphreys a couple of years before I retired. Um, Tim Finn called me up and said, because I was an E7 at the time, and it was like an E5 slot. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of guys, like Keith talked about, you know, going to Korea, getting it knocked out of the way. It was just one of those things that I'm not going to say I miss, I miss not going. It just never did happen. Sure. never worked out where it ended, ended up that that happened for me. I decided I wanted to get my diamond, you know, and become first sergeant. So I think I, that was 97. So um, unheard of for some reason or another, they were able to pull some, because they rarely ever let an individual go from a squadron become a diamond for a sergeant and come back to that squadron. Yeah. You know, they send them somewhere else. They allowed me to do that and uh, and to come back to the unit as the first sergeant. Nice. And um, I enjoyed that. And again, I told you, I enjoyed the Air Force the element of it. I enjoyed going to Scott and some of the functions and the events and all. But it, it, it made it a little bit, it was challenging because even though we, when I was a senior NCO and I was a superintendent and I had friends who were E5s and E fours, he said he had to have that level of separation between work and play and, and figure all that out. But when you're a diamond wearing first sergeant, then you really do. Yeah. You know, I mean then it really kind of separates things. And the guys loved to it didn't make a difference that I had a diamond. They still mess with me. Oh, Mikey Brown, Larry Patton. They <laughs> they love to do things to mess with me, get under my skin all the time. But uh, but I enjoyed it and um I enjoyed the you know, commander's calls and the events that we had and um Ultimately, obviously, when I got my diamond, that was the end of my jumping. Yeah, you know, because I didn't. It wasn't that wasn't a jump slot for me there. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I finished up there. I uh, finished up as the first sergeant. A lot of good people went through there. 
There are guys who stayed 30 years and all. I didn't really have a game plan earlier on because I was like an E7 at 12 years. I retired as an E7. And part of that was around 1996 or so, my father-in-law down here in Birmingham, Alabama, started his own business. He'd had multiple businesses over the years, this industrial tool and supply business where it caters to the automotive and the steel service centers and fabricators, people who cut the material to build buildings and all that kind of stuff. And he was welding bandsaw blades, which is a, an art in itself. It takes, you can't just pull somebody off the street, a welder off the street to do that. Yeah. And he had talked to me about wanting to come down and be in the business with him. He said, what's your plans? And I said, oh, I just don't know. I mean, you know, but eventually we just decided that was going to be the best thing. My wife was from here. it will be the opportunity for her to come back down here for our girls to be able to be to here with their, with their grandparents. Oh, yeah. So I spent my last couple of years using most of my leave coming down here and working with him, learning how to weld, learning different things and, and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of obviously knew that at 20, I was going to retire. Okay. I wasn't going to stay longer. And I mean, everybody's got to make a choice sooner or later, you know, what's best for them, what's best for their family, what's best you know, for everybody involved. And, um, you know, the Air Force had been very good to me. The career field had been very good to me. I mean, I, I'm so grateful and thankful for the opportunities that I was given. You interviewed the guy on, uh, what was it, Surfer Brigade? Oh, yeah. Kevin, Surfer Kevin Brigade. Liberté. Yep, Kevin, Surfer Brigade. Yeah. Yeah, and he talked about purpose. You know, you know, he talked about a lot of special. There's no comparison when you're an 18, 19, 20 year old and you're flying around, and you're sitting on a helicopter with your legs hanging out, or you know, you're deploying out in the field. I mean, you just don't get those opportunities in in, in normal life as a young person to have those opportunities. I just, uh, to me, the Air Force, and and, and I can't really speak about today's military because I've been gone for so long. I do hear things that are, you know, not necessarily just about the career field, but other things in general that are disturbing to me. And I do see a lot of it in my own industry when it comes just to attitudes about work and labor and work ethics and all that other kind of stuff. But uh, for me personally, I mean, I attribute a large portion of who I am and who I became and any success that I had to the Air Force, right. you know, and, and for the and for a lot of those great people that I had the opportunity to work for both on the NCO and on the officer side of the house. So um, I know when, when I after I'd been welding for like a couple, about a year and a half or so, my father-in-law was like, you know what? He goes, I, he goes, you need to be a sales guy. I need, I need to get you, you need to be out there selling and representing the company selling. And I was like, ah, oh, Dan, I said, man, I'm a military guy, man. I said, um, I said, either I told somebody to do something or somebody told me to do something. <laughs> right. I said, I said, there wasn't a whole lot of selling involved. But then I went out on sales and all that. And then I st started thinking back and, you know, some of the guys that you've interviewed before here in the past talked about the fact that, yeah, of course we were salesmen. Yeah. We sold all the time. Right. <laughs> we sold to the army, you know, what we came, what we were bringing to the field, what we were bringing to the battle. And of course you had to prove yourself right. and get to get the respect that has come over the years, well-deserved for a lot of guys that didn't get, you know, quite the same opportunities. But a lot of guys who've also made a lot, a lot of sacrifices. Yes. Yeah. You know, I uh, I don't know. I just, you've talked about the TACP Association, all that. I think what they do is a wonderful thing. I think the, where that, that group has come from and, and what they've done and what they've developed, and, you know, what they do behind the scenes that people don't really know about and, and how much is being done to uh, to support people in the, in the TACP community out there, including families and and children, yeah. you know, and, and, and others. I mean, I, I feel a special part of, of knowing that I was part of, not the association, but the community that it came up that the, where the association was created, created for. Sure. So yeah, now it's been 23 years. Wow. Yeah. So 23 years I came down here. I'm actually sitting in my office right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause it was easier to come here. Sure. Um, I've been here for 23 years now. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I mentioned in there about, you know, Lunk loves to mess. He loves to mess with me. So he does this thing. <laughs> I was wondering what that cut. meant. I saw that in there. I was wondering. Yeah, the 69 cross cut. So when we were at the, uh, <laughs> did you go to the Tatakpi uh, uh, reunion in Nashville? No, I didn't. I missed that one. Okay. It okay. was a great event. Yeah. It's one, one of the few that I've been to. But that long, man. So I've got a voicemail. You know, it's the it's the late night call. So I still get them over the years. <laughs> sure. Um, I told you I was in Italy at the time. Oh, yeah. You know, so I had to text him, let him know I was in Italy. And he's... He, he doesn't know what he's talking about as far as it, like in my world, this world here. Yeah. So he comes up with crazy things and he keep somehow he's labeled this, this 69 crosscut blade. And he's like, since I don't know about it, 
then I obviously don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> right. and I don't have to so we're sitting at that reunion. All of a sudden, my phone, like Chachi's up there talking, and all the stuff's going on. I look at my phone as a text. Long just texted me a picture of a of a '69 crosscut blade that he had just looked up online. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, so he loves the man. But yeah, he left me a voicemail. I think he said uh, I asked him afterwards because I couldn't tell who was with him. But he said uh, Scott Lozier and uh, Marty were with him. Oh, okay. Um, at the at the time, and I think uh, Chris Span Chris Span might have been. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, but I don't know, man. Like I said. Um, sometimes I feel so removed from everything. Sometimes I don't feel like I do as good a job as I should and staying in touch with my, you know, my brothers out there. And, and, you know, I'm trying to do better on that. I get wrapped up in a lot of things. And you know, like I said, I've got a group of close friends, just like I'm sure you do that. We try and stay in touch on a regular basis. But, um, but yeah, I, uh, I have no regrets, man. That was a great, great time during my life. I mean, yeah, the, the breaking the ankle and getting the, I mean, those things happen. You're young, you think you're invincible, sure. you don't, you're indestructible and all that, you know, but, uh, but no, it was a great experience. And um, I take a lot from what I learned in the military or what's in, yeah, I say learn, but a lot of it's just embedded in me, you know, yeah. it just comes natural, right? you know, and, and I've had to have my chain yanked a few times here. <laughs> powers that be my in-laws and all like, you know, this is not a military operation here. Not, not so much. I've mellowed out a lot. Sure. But when I first got here, I was like, hey, man, we, I got checklists that we can implement here. <laughs> we, we, you know, I could get this thing running like smooth operation. But it's been great. It's been a blessing. And um, like I said, uh, I just greatly appreciate the opportunity. You know, when I heard y'all get told me about your show before you interviewed him, because I, I didn't know about it originally. And that's when I looked up. I mean, he's like, he's got jazz on here, man. He got Kenny Lindsay, J Mac, Roger Cross, just guys that I've known forever. And and I just, uh, when you reached out to me, I was like, man, I'm not in these guys category, man. I mean, I don't have the stories to tell, you know, I can ramble on for an hour and a half, I guess, but I can't. I think you're just right with those guys. When I, when I think of all those guys you mentioned, I, you are firmly within that group. A lot of guys are like you though. They're very, you guys are all real humble. You, uh, you did your duty and, um, you know, you served honorably, but just know that there's guys like me that consider you all not only legends, like I said, but also pillars of this career field. Like there's guys like me wouldn't have been anywhere without guys like you. And I, I really appreciate, you know, everything you've done, everything you did for me personally and everything you did for the career field. I appreciate it. I do. And like I said, I great, greatly appreciate what you're doing with your, with your podcast here in this format, because, uh, I mean, I haven't listened to all of them, but I've listened to a lot of them and, you know, guys that I don't know that, you know, and that you served with, right. you know, especially, like I said, post 9-11 guys, because I was already out by then, yeah. you know, I'd been out for a year and a half by then. And um, I have tremendous respect for for them. For, for I mean, I as soon as uh, Del Toro's book came out, I bought it, sure. you know, I got to read this. Man. Obviously, everybody knows who he is I'm watching him and. Read his book. Great story. I know you had him on the show a little while back as well. And just uh, just thankful I was able to be part of a community that has really elevated itself in a lot of ways over the years and developed a lot of real special people in the career field that have gone on to do a lot of other good things out there as well, too. You know, so, I mean, I'm, I'm always thankful for uh, people who are always looking to give back. And you're certainly giving back to this podcast that you put together. And like I said, I greatly appreciate you reaching out to me and let me uh, let me sp spend a little time telling you my story. Oh, for sure. It was great. I thought it was awesome. Well, you probably, th this goes back to reflect on, yeah, I probably put a little more time because sometimes I just don't think I can process all the, you know, in my head, some of these guys can just spit this stuff out when I'm like, well, I got to put everything down and just throw it at them and, you know, we'll just see where it lands yeah. and, and go from there. So, but, uh, but yeah, it's been great. And again, I, I appreciate the opportunity and I wish you the best of luck in your continued interviews and podcasts down the road there as you, uh, as you reach out to other guys out there too, as well. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks. I hope more people reach out and, uh, and are willing to come on because the, the stories are awesome. And I think a lot of people need to hear them. So yeah. Thanks again. I, yep. I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really do appreciate it. No problem, JD. Thank you. All right. All right. Take care.